and local law enforcement. The Secretary of Defense and I spoke by telephone with the Governor to better understand the situation in Minneapolis and see if he required any additional assistance. This conversation helped inform my military advice. Over the night of 29 May, the number of violent protests increased nationally to 13 major cities, escalating to 34 just two days later. By the morning of 1 June, 29 states and the District of Columbia had activated the National Guards, totaling more than 17,000 National Guards men and women. In Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, faced three nights of escalating violence starting on Friday, May 29th. The White House increased its security posture. The federal government vacated certain buildings. Our nation's monuments and government buildings were defaced. Businesses in D.C. were looted, and some were set ablaze. With more than 420 arrests and 150 law enforcement officers and half a dozen National Guardsmen injured, it was reported to me that it was the worst three days of violence in Washington, D.C. in over 30 years. There were troops and police from 22 different organizations, not including those from the active duty in the vicinity of the military district of Washington. There were three major departments, Department of Justice, Department of the Interior, and Department of Defense, all involved. There were National Guard troops from 11 different states. And the chain of command for those National Guard troops ran from the President to the Secretary of Defense to the Secretary of the Army to Major General Walker, and it never changed. Since the protests began, I sought information to help me assess the ability of federal, state, and local authorities to handle situations under their responsibility. And I met and spoke with National Guard leadership and troops often, Army and DOD leadership, Department of Justice, and others, along with governors and D.C. officials. I continually assessed and advised that it was not necessary to employ active duty troops in response to the civil unrest occurring in our nation. It was my view then, and it remains so now, that local, state, and federal police, backed up by the National Guard under governor control, could and continually can effectively handle the security situation in every case across the country. However, I recommended to the Secretary of Defense, and he ordered about 1,700 active duty troops to an increased alert posture in the vicinity of Washington, D.C., but none of them were ever used, and there was never an active duty troop used in any location anywhere in the United States. Additionally, I repeatedly advised the Secretary of Defense, and he repeatedly ordered de-escalation measures to be taken including removing weapons and helmets and consistent with force protection measures. These de-escalation measures were widely implemented from 2 to 3 June, and by 4 June, active duty and National Guard units began redeploying from the vicinity of Washington, D.C. back to their home station. And a more detailed account is in the written record. I'm incredibly proud of the professionalism exhibited by the citizen soldiers who make up our National Guard. Since their formation, they have operated in support of local and state governments throughout history responding to hurricanes, forest fires, health crises, COVID-19, the pandemic, and many forms of civil unrest throughout the years. By my research, I count at least 19 times that National Guard and militia troops were used in support of the Insurrection Act, and it's important to note the Insurrection Act was not invoked in the last several weeks. The United States military comes from the people of our nation, and we remain dedicated to the Constitution. We will never turn our back on that document. We swore an oath of allegiance at the cost of our lives to an idea embedded within that document. And we will always protect it. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, members will now be recognized in the order that they were here when the gavel dropped. It, there is a five minute limit, and sorry, we will have. We won't have enough time to get to every member, so I'm going to be ruthless on the five-minute clock. Um, and one of the hardest problems there is a lot of times witnesses are in the middle of an answer um, when that five-minute clock goes up. I am not attempting to be rude or attempting to cut you off. I will try to give you the opportunity to complete your thought. Uh, but as members ask questions and witnesses answer, understand when the five minutes is up, we're going to do our level best to, as quickly as possible, move on to the next member. And with that, uh, first on our side is Representative Davis, who is uh, participating remotely. Uh, Representative Davis, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you uh, to uh, Secretary Esper and, and General Milley. We appreciate your, your joining us for this. I, uh, I wanted to uh, start with you, uh, Mr. Secretary. Uh, you mentioned the after action review on July 30th. Is that on course um, for the end of the, the month? And will we be scheduling a briefing on that? 
Congress, I'm not sure I, I heard uh, parts of your question uh, didn't come through, I, I, but I think you asked, is the, is the after action review on track and will you be briefed on it? If that was your question, I spoke to uh, Secretary McCarthy uh, just yesterday. As, as you may know, he played a very prominent role in all this. I know he briefed the committee a few weeks ago along with General Walker, uh, but he is handling uh, that piece of the review. Uh, his assessment uh, currently is that it's on track. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm, though, however, more concerned about getting it right than getting it done quick. Uh, but my aim would be after that to, uh, to make that available to you. Also something that I put forth in my directive to him was to be prepared to take his findings and recommendations and to have a, a similar conversation, a similar type of review process with uh, law enforcement that was on the ground in D.C. because I think that's a, a very important <coughs> second step in that process to have that discussion so that we can have the lessons learned yes. and work them out between us and law enforcement for the, uh, uh, if this happens again. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I know we're all concerned about um, being prepared. And I, I wanted to, to especially focus on um, the 1st of June because that was a time that there was concern that there was a great deal of violence that day and, and the understanding I think of most people that were on the ground in terms of uh, including the reporting of the Washington Post and others is that um, that particular day actually it was peaceful and uh, there may have been a, a few incidents I, I don't know I wasn't there but I understand from all the reporting that that was the case and that um, that they, in, in fact, the park police, as you, as you mentioned, um, was there. You talked, uh, General Milley talked about the guard being there as backup. But um, we saw uh, Attorney General Bill Barr actually talking about the fact that it was, that it was violent and that they um, needed to move forward because uh, the, they, were, they were very worried of, of things um, coming out of control. And I just wondered if, do you, from where you sit today, do you think that that uh, assessment that in fact it was violent on that day and that there was a need uh, to even have the guard as backup, is, is that true? Do you, do you think that in further uh, reflection that that isn't quite what, what people thought? Uh, Congresswoman, I think when you look back at the days leading up to June 1st, you see a tremendous amount of, uh, of, of violence that had been building up over a period of days. If I have my numbers right, that over a period of three days, I think eventually, uh, regrettably, over 50 park police officers were injured. Uh, over 60 Secret Service agents were injured. We had six National Guardsmen hurt, to include one who was hit in the head with a brick and suffered a concussion. Uh, you had parts of D.C. to include the church set on fire and uh, other acts of vandalism across uh, the area. So there was a, a great deal of consternation uh, by law enforcement uh, with regard to what might happen that evening of uh, June 1st. I think that's why there was the push to get additional law enforcement in as soon as possible, uh, backed up by uh, National Guard so that you had enough presence to calm the situation down uh, regain some degree of control and allow for Americans to peacefully protest uh, their government to express their outrage over the brutal murder of George Floyd and to allow those things to happen free of violence from uh, those individuals, those uh, folks out there who were trying to cause mischief. So that's my assessment. I, the chairman may have uh, something to Thank add on you. that. Well, I think I was just going to say, Secretary, I think that, that this certainly is an, an area to take a very hard look at and um, to be certain that it's clear among the departments because even when we ask those questions, uh, when we had a, a army leadership here, uh, they actually were not clear about what was going on. They had situational awareness, uh, but they didn't know who ordered the clearing of protesters or who authorized the helicopters uh, to uh, use- I'm sorry, the, the general ladies, so all Susan, those issues need general, to be looked at. Your, your time has expired. Uh, Thank you. Mr. Turner is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first off, I want to thank Secretary Esper and General Milley for your leadership. Uh, you give great confidence to everyone in this committee on both sides of the aisle. I want to appreciate your strong words, both of you, um, on the, uh, the killing of George Floyd. Um, 
and the fact that your whole focus is protecting people's First Amendment rights is incredibly important and should be foundational and important to, the, to this discussion. I appreciate your recognition of the outrage that everyone felt. And I appreciate your condemnation of racism and the fact that we're dealing with this as a nation across all areas and you're being called at a very difficult time. Mr. Secretary, I appreciate your um, the statements on diversity and inclusion. This committee took several actions with the National Defense Authorization Act that I think will be helpful and we look forward to your comments on those. You made a statement. I have three questions. We have limited time. Mm -hmm. I have three questions. One, you said that the Guard is best to support these efforts. Is it because of their dual nature of the fact that they are both private citizens and serve in the military? I think, uh, first of all, Congressman, thank you for your, your comments. Uh, First of all, I think uh, that one, they are citizen soldiers and that matters because they often come from those communities in which they may be serving. They are protecting their fellow, uh, uh, fellow <coughs> Americans. They understand what's happening in, in the neighborhoods and the community. So I think that's important. Number two, they are trained in many cases to do civil disturbance. And number three, they are equipped to do this. So it's uh, part of what we call their mission essential task list, their metal tasks in most cases, to perform these duties. And, and again, be, having been a citizen soldier myself, I appreciate their, their capacity at this, which is better in many cases than the active duty. Mr. Secretary, I have a question for you that I believe it has the narrowness of, which is gonna be helpful for all of us. So I would appreciate if you'd let me finish the entire question to, so we can get to the narrowness part that I think will give you comfort. I understand the rules with respect to classified material, and I also understand that things that haven't happened are not classified. Mr. Secretary, during your time as Secretary, have you ever received an intelligence briefing where it stated that Russia had offered bounties for the killing of American soldiers? And if you had, wouldn't you think that was important enough to bring to the attention of the President? And I'm focusing here on the nearness of the word bounties. And I want you to know also that the people in this room know the answer to the question. We're not able to give the answer uh, because of the rules, but you are. And I think with the narrowness of this question, we would greatly appreciate your answering it. Have you received a intel briefing that stated, that included the word <laughs> bounty with respect to Russians uh, and uh, the killing of American men and women in uniform? Congressman, to the best of my recollection, I have not received a briefing that included the word bounty. Mr. Secretary, I really appreciate you saying that. Now, the next question then is, and if you had, wouldn't that have risen to the level of importance enough for you to bring it to the president's attention? That would be an action item, wouldn't it? I mean, that would be so outrageous that, that you would bring that up the chain of command. If, if it was a credible report, that's important, a credible corroborated report that, had, that used those words, uh, certainly uh, it would have been brought to my attention by the chain of command, by the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and others uh, for action. It would have been, uh, and we would have taken upon that action in an interagency effort to make sure that we got, we, we addressed it. But look, at all times, we take uh, force protection very seriously and take all those actions, regardless of the credibility of a report, we take all that seriously. I understand. Turning back to, to this issue, um, Mr. Secretary, um, the mayor of D.C. has a police chief. Governors have access to other resources with respect to the Guard. Could you compare and contrast those with us? It's important for people to understand when people talk about the mayor of D.C. being consulted versus a governor being consulted, what their structures are. So first of all, I want to commend the, uh, the police chief of Metro Police Department. He, uh, he worked very well and was very helpful uh, to the Secretary of the Army during uh, those difficult days. So I, I want to commend him. Uh, but as I understand it, uh, he is the police force for Washington, D.C. Uh, Washington, D.C. does not have a state police force like many other states have that, can be, that they can call upon if they will. And, of course, the D.C. Guard uh, does not report to the mayor. The D.C. Guard, the commander, is the commander-in-chief, uh, the president, who can delegate that authority to me, and then I can further delegate it down. So the capabilities of the D.C. to handle... Uh, civil unrest is limited, as best I know it, to just the Metro Police Department. And Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Larson is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, appreciate the opportunity to ask a few questions. 
Um, first off, for Secretary Esper, and this has to do with the after action report and the coordination question. Um, the DC National Guard leadership uh, is, in response to the DC protest, the DC National Guard leadership is the only agency that runs through a chain of command up to you. Is that correct? The, uh, yes, the chain of the DC chain of command, National Guard chain of command, runs from the uh, commanding general, Major General Walker, to the Secretary of the Army, to me, and then to the President of the United States. And that was the only agency unit involved that ran through the chain of command of the department. Is that right? I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? It, I didn't pick up the second word that you said. I'm sorry. Uh, that's the only. That's the only uh, agency that ran up through the DOD chain of command in response to the DC protests. Is that right? Yes, that would be outside of act, any active duty. That's correct uh, with regard to Title 32. Otherwise, all other uh, National Guard forces, either in their home states or that eventually deployed to Washington, D.C., remained under the command of the state's governors. And uh, okay. General Walker's that's role fine. was tactical control that's on the ground. Yeah. So there's video of non-uniformed uh, federal government folks who were deployed to Washington, D.C., presumably from the Bureau of Prisons and presumably from, at the request of the Attorney General. You mentioned that you're doing an after-action report, and that after-action report will apply only at this point to the Department of Defense and the DC National Guard. Is that where it stands right now? Uh, yes, Congressman. The, the note I sent to the Secretary of the Army was to look at, uh, at the National Guard writ large. Uh, it directed them to focus also on uh, the events in DC, and then, of course, uh, uh, related issues that arose, like the use of helicopters. And his, he is to look at training, equipping, uh, organization, all those issues that might be uh, that his findings that might include r r findings and lessons learned for for future uh, for f for future uh, employment of the National Guard. Thank you. Do you know at this time whether or not the head of the DC National Guard uh, was aware of the deployment of these uh, non-uniformed, uh, presumably federal law enforcement uh, folks? that created a perimeter around the White House, I think on June 3rd. Was that coordinated? You, have you concluded that that was coordinated yet uh, with the with the DC National Guard? Well, I, again, I'm not sure I, I understand your question. Let me answer it this way. I, the chairman and I spoke to Major General Walker yesterday. He had, a, he had an understanding of who uh, was on the ground in Lafayette Park. He was there. He knew that uh, that the D.C. National Guard were in a supporting role to the uh, Park Police. Uh, I think okay, can I stop you there? Can I, I stop you there? You're talking about Lafayette Park, and that's fine. But there were other law enforcement deployed who were apparently non-local, non-D.C. They were federal law enforcement, also deployed to take actions within D.C., within the boundaries of the District of Columbia. And I'm asking if that those if you know yet whether or not those actions were coordinated with the D.C. National Guard or, or, or not. Uh, I, my, my understanding is because I was with Secretary of the Army McCarthy, uh, the chairman, we were down at the FBI Joint Operations Center on Monday evening with representatives from a, a number of agencies. I can't list them all, the federal as, as you described them. So I, I know it was fairly well coordinated. Secretary McCarthy did a uh, an outstanding job with regard to working that out on the spot, and uh, Major General Walker was by his side most of the time. Uh, I'll turn to Chairman Milley, see if he has anything to add on that. I've got about 30 seconds. So, uh, Congressman, I would, I, I can't confirm or deny that <clears throat> all of those uh, federal law enforcement agencies were tied into the D.C. National Guard. Uh, personally, you know, for Walker, I'd have to go talk to Walker specifically about that. Uh, but all of the federal agencies uh, came underneath the Department of Justice, except for the Park Police, who are under the Department of the Interior, and the Metro Police remain under the command and control of the mayor. Um, so I Thank don't you. know if that helps clarify or not. But. Thank you. Uh, a little bit. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Yeah, no, that does, does help. That's a major question that, that we have. Uh, Mr. Rogers is recognized uh, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, the Secretary. Mr. Chairman, thank you both for being here and for your service to our country. Uh, Mr. Secretary, in early June, uh, you requested uh, members of the National Guard under Section 502F of Title 32. Uh, you made some reference to this, but can you give us a more full picture of what the command and control structure under that authority is and kind of give us an organizational uh, structure? Are you speaking, I assume, within Washington, D.C.? Within Washington, D.C., yes. yes sir. I'm sorry. So uh, you're right. On the, uh, on the uh, afternoon of 1 June, uh, the, uh, w we knew we would have available uh, throughout that evening up to 1,200 uh, D.C. National Guard. Uh, as we just described, they work for Major General Walker, who was reporting to Secretary of the Army McCarthy, who was reporting to me. Uh, we uh, estimated that we needed 3,800 additional National Guard to uh, support the efforts in D.C. Uh, so uh, what we did was, through a combination of myself and General Langell, had reached out to a number of states uh, to seek the permission from the governor to deploy uh, uh, their elements of their guard to D.C. to support the law enforcement effort. Uh, 11 states, if my number is correct, uh, it provided that, and it got us to a little bit over 5,000 on the ground. It took a period of days to do that, but that gave us the numbers we needed. At all times, the outside, the, the, the guard units coming in from outside of D.C., non-D.C. National Guard, were under 502F authorities, provided, funded by the federal government. Uh, their role was to protect federal functions, property, and personnel, and at all times, they remained under the control of their governors. I uh, want to shift a little bit. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in your opening remarks, you made reference to the fact that 60,000 service members have been uh, employed dealing with a variety of issues, uh, mostly COVID, but some other law enforcement. And I know it's mostly National Guard. Uh, and this is kind of a follow-up to, to Mr. Thornberry's uh, questions. Uh, how are they holding up with all this variety of missions that's been hoisted? And 47,000 of those are, are National Guardsmen have been working in COVID. What is the state of the National Guard right now, given the, the, the way they're being spread out? And then as a follow-up to that, the economic impact to your budgets and uh, what we are going to need to backfill. So I, the, the numbers, you, you got the numbers about right. For the National Guard Nash, uh, globally, uh, about 120,000. Uh, are uh, uh, on duty, on active duty, um, about 45,000, I think, if I remember this right from my briefing with Joe Langell, um, about 45,000 are dedicated to COVID, about at the peak, not right this minute, but at the peak, there were uh, around 40 to 43,000 uh, on the civil unrest under governor control. Uh, and then there's about 30,000 uh, doing Title 10 missions uh, around the world uh, or in, in the United States. So uh, about 120 total. Uh, which is significant. That's a, a big chunk of the, uh, of the U.S. National uh, Guard, both Army and a Air. Uh, the reports to me are uh, morale is good. They feel uh, good about their contribution, uh, and they join the Guard to uh, make sure that they make a contribution to the nation. So um, I, I'm not particularly aware of any particular issues, but they're going pretty fast at a high op tempo, probably faster than they have in the past, except during the surge periods of Iraq and Afghanistan. What about the economic impact to your budgets of having these uh, individuals deployed in these various missions uh, that were unplanned? I, uh, there is an economic impact. Uh, I don't know that it's, uh, it's not going to, I don't think it's going to break the DOD back on the economic impact because of the numbers, but uh, it, there is an impact, absolutely. Uh, so you don't expect to be asking uh, uh, the Congress for additional money to replace that or backfill that money uh, in a supplemental later this year? I'll leave that up to the Secretary. We've, we've been uh, keeping careful counting of the dollars to the Comptroller. Uh, that's obviously something we need to come back to on to make sure we understand what those numbers are and how material they are to the budget. Okay. And finally, Mr. Secretary, uh, do you believe that the Insurrection Act needs any legislative modification by this Congress? Well, the, uh, the, the Insurrection Act is, is an extraordinary piece of legislation, as we know, is, is, is endured well over the past couple hundred years, and it is the, under the exclusive authority of the President. So uh, it would not be appropriate for me to opine uh, in terms of material changes to the Act. I would reserve that to the, uh, to the President. Uh, my, my view is there's nothing that's happened that's, that strikes me as compelling to, to change it at this point in time. Great. Thank you both for being here. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Courtney is recognized for five minutes. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Adam, and uh, thank you to the witnesses uh, for being here today. Uh, particularly, I want to um, recognize both of you made very strong uh, comments and uh, expressing, you know, your upholding your oath in terms of uh, supporting the First Amendment and people's right to, to protest peacefully. Of course, another part of the First Amendment is uh, freedom of the press, and freedom of the press did not have a very good day on, on June 1st. A couple of days ago, over at the Natural Resources Committee, uh, a reporter from Australia, Amelia Brace, um, who is a TV news reporter, was uh, at Lafayette uh, Park with her cameraman, Tim Myers, when the U.S. Park Police, uh, two, two of the uh, officers, um, just completely uh, assaulted them on live television. Uh, she was actually broadcasting into the uh, morning show in Australia. It's kind of the equivalent of uh, the Today Show. And um, I don't know if it's still coming through here, but uh, in any case, um, her testimony uh, described, again, the right uh, shield of the park police being rammed into the uh, chest and stomach of the cameraman. And on camera, you could see her getting hit with a truncheon. She was shot with uh, rubber bullets and both of them were, were hospitalized. So again, I just wanted to maybe give you both an opportunity to just um, go on the record to say that, um, you know, we obviously as part of uh, recognizing the First Amendment, recognize that um, the media has a role to play that's protected uh, by the Constitution. In fact, the <laughs> order that the mayor issued exempted uh, the media from the, the curfew that was in place on, on June 1st. And I just want to, again, would ask both of you to comment on that, because frankly, the, this was on live television in Australia, who was probably one of our closest allies. Congressman, I'll go first. And uh, you're right, Australia is one of our most important allies. I, I spent the other night, as the, the chairman knows, uh, speaking with my counterpart in Australia. Let me say this, uh, we've said it numerous times, uh, I've sworn oath to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States, and I do that not, not just because I swore an oath, but because I believe deeply in that document and all that it guarantees our rights and, and democracy. And you've talked about the, the, First Amem uh, the, the First Amendment, that includes the Big Five, and one of which is the freedom of the press, and I think a free and open press is critical to the functioning, the efficient functioning of our democracy. And so uh, I think that's something that we need, we cherish. That's one of the reasons why, you know, the National Guard, when it gets used in defense of support of civil authorities, uh, is out there, is to give Americans the right to peacefully assemble, to express their views, and for the press to cover it, uh, hope, hopefully as accurately as possible, uh, so that the American people can uh, ha have an understanding of what's happening in, in the country. And Congressman, um, I'm not familiar with the particular incident that you're referring to, um, but I'm deeply committed to a free press. Um, like I said, I'll, I'll die for the Constitution. It's an idea, and part of that is a free media, and a, and a free media um, is fundamentally essential to uh, a free people, uh, and it's fundamental to our democracy, so absolutely I'm committed to that. Well, thank you both. Again, this was front page news in Australia, and, um, and I would just say that um, it was the park police, it was not National Guard men who were involved in that um, violence that took place there. But the fact is, is as uh, the Secretary's testimony indicates, the uh, DC National Guard was acting in support of uh, local police authorities, including the park police. And, uh, and I think, frankly, whatever after, after, after action report goes out, uh, the fact that media are present in situations where uh, they have a legal uh, duty, not just a right, to, but a duty to be there, uh, which was recognized by the District of Columbia, um, that really there's got to be some training to make sure that people recognize that um, you know, it's off limits to, to uh, treat them with in any way that's inappropriate, which is exactly what happened. And I would encourage you to watch the testimony, uh, which took place from Ms. Brace. It's, it's actually quite shocking. And, and frankly, given the fact that it happened to an ally of ours, uh, it, it will make you heart sick to watch it. And with that, I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Conaway is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. I'll yield my time for the next Republican on the list. Okay. Uh, Mr. Lamborn. Mr. Lamborn, are you with us? Ms. Stefanik. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, gentlemen, for your service. Um, I wanted to focus on an issue of importance to constituents in my district. I've had the privilege of hosting both of you, Secretary Esper, in your capacity when you were Secretary of the Army, as well as General Milley. Uh, I've spent time with you at Fort Drum. And given some of the recent press reports regarding Afghanistan, as you know, I represent military families and 10th Mountain Division soldiers who are currently deployed in Afghanistan. And I wanted to get your comments, General Milley, on your commitment and the department's commitment to force protection at all costs. That is one of my top priorities, whether it's rebuilding military readiness, investing in training, investing in equipment, and having the most exquisite, exceptional intelligence that's verified out there. But I think it's important for families to know the lengths to which the department goes to ensure that we are protecting the safety and well-being of our service members deployed. I'll start with you, General Milley. You have a thousand percent uh, commitment. I've got three tours in Afghanistan and multiple tours in a lot of other places. Uh, and I've buried a lot of people in Arlington National Cemetery. So I am committed to the nth degree to protect our force. And uh, we will ensure that uh, they have all the right equipment, training, uh, uh, alerts, warnings, intel, et cetera. Uh, I know what you're referring to, uh, specifically with the Russians. Uh, and I will tell you that we were at the highest levels of force protection. Uh, units and people uh, are and were informed and will remain informed. And um, we're going to get to the bottom of all that, but I can assure the families that the force protection of our force, uh, not only for me, but for every commander all the way down the line, uh, that's, the, that's the number one priority for every one of us. Absolutely. Thank you. Secretary Esper? I 1,000 percent agree as well. I say it again as a, a former soldier myself with, with one combat tour under my belt. Uh, this is something we talk with, I talk about with the commanders all the time, General Miller and General McKenzie on multiple occasions. We make adjustments all the time across the theater and other theaters, but force protection is number one. Uh, to take care of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, they are our most vital resource, our most trusted asset, and we will do everything and anything it takes to protect them. Uh, my next question, and just so you know, I sit on the House Intelligence Committee, so I have received the classified briefings. Understanding we are in an unclassified setting right now, I, I also think it's important to talk about how we know, um, going years back, that Russia has meddled in Afghanistan, as well as other countries have also involved themselves in Afghanistan. Uh, counter to our commitments and our strategic goals in the region, whether that's Iran, whether that's China using economic tools. So I wanted to get your comment on that because I think it's important to consider that uh, long-term uh, impact rather than just this one um, illegal leak that's been covered in the media. Well, on the uh, specific to the Russians, yes, we've known for years that the Russians have been involved uh, for their own national security interests. And, in Afghanistan, and, and the Russians are not our friends, uh, and their involvement is worrisome, and we monitor it closely and we take the appropriate actions. Uh, the Chinese are involved, the Pakistanis are involved, the Iranians, there's a lot of countries involved in Afghanistan. Uh, and and the, many of them have malfeasance of forethought against uh, the U.S. and U.S. forces, et cetera. Uh, we're aware of a lot of that, uh, not perhaps every single thing, but we're aware of a lot of it, and we take the appropriate measures. Uh, and with respect to the issue, and it was previously asked by one of the other congressmen, um, we, we are aware of the the variety of intelligence that you are briefed on this morning, um, and, and uh, we are pursuing that. Secretary Esper, any comments on that? I share the same views as the chairman. The Russians have been involved, uh, and many, many other countries and many other players, you know, non-state players in Afghanistan for a long time. And uh, we take all that into account. And I can tell you on other occasions, we have adapted force posture, we've adapted authorities, equipment, um, uh, you, you name it, rules of engagement to make sure that our forces were well protected and able to accomplish their mission. And then my last question, can you discuss the damage that illegal leaks have on, um, on our ability to collect intelligence, on our force protection measures? Because I'm very concerned the damage that illegal leaks have in general when it comes to our national security. I'm conscious of the clock. The illegal leaks are terrible. They're happening across the government, particularly in the Defense Department. I'm pushing forward on a new effort to remind people of OPSEC, whether it's, uh, it's pre-decisional, uh, unclassified items, or even classified items. It hurts our national security, it jeopardizes our troops, and it is just damaging to our government and our relationships with our allies and partners. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Garamendi is recognized for five minutes.
Mr. Garamendi, are you with us? Make sure you unmute yourself. Don't see him actually, so we'll move on to Mr. Norcross. Mr. Norcross, are you with us? Yes, I am. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Secretary Esper, in your opening remarks, you mentioned that the National Guard did not play an active role or advance on the crowd, did not use rubber bullets, paraphrasing that, and used the term static role. I'd like to focus on that and the events of June 1st involving the Army National Guard helicopter. How would you refer to that as a static role? And uh, I have a follow-up when we're finished. Congressman, uh, I, I was referring to the static role with regard to the uh, actions of the National Guard in Lafayette Park on uh, June 1st. Uh, the helicopter issues in question that you're raising happened later that evening, I think maybe around 11 p.m. or so. I, I don't recall the times. So obviously that was different. That was not a, a, st a static role. I was talking about the, um, the, uh, the, the forces on the ground in Lafayette Park. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, when Secretary uh, McCarthy was with us uh, earlier this month, he mentioned that the report on the investigation was going to be very soon. Uh, we understand it might be finished now. When is that going to be released to us and to the public? So, Congressman, uh, I spoke to Secretary McCarthy about this. Uh, as you know, I, I launched this investigation within two hours of finding out about it, I think, on June 2nd, if memory serves me. Uh, the investigation was conducted. It is completed. It is being reviewed by Secretary McCarthy. I think, uh, DOD, if I'm looking at the Chairman Milley, DOD, IG may take a look at it. Um, but it should be available next week to the committee. Uh, that's my the latest report I got from the uh, Secretary of the Army. Chairman, is that correct? Th that's correct. The IG, DOD, IG has to do their review. Uh, so I would expect it pretty shortly, like within days, perhaps early next week. Thank you. And I yield the balance of my time to Mikey Sharp, New Jersey. Yeah, that, that gets awkward. Um, pause the clock for a second. Um, Mikey, um, do you wish to take the time? If you do, you got to come forward. Mm -hmm. Beg your pardon? Oh, she's here. Michelle, you're recognized for the remainder of the time, a few minutes and 40 seconds. Thank you. Secretary Esper and General Milley, um, I echo the chairman's concern about politicizing our military and given the attempts at politicizing our military in the unorthodox way the president attempted to control troops in our nation's capital, I want to discuss some of the legal underpinnings of civilian control. Because I have such a short period of time, I'm looking for a yes or no. If you don't know the answer, please just let me know. You'll take it for action. Um, Secretary Esper and General Milley, you've both testified that you have taken oaths to the Constitution of the United States. Is that correct? Yes. And that oath includes uh, an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and bear true faith and allegiance to the same, correct? Yes. <laughs> yes. And are you both aware that Article 2 of the Constitution states that the executive power shall be vested in a president, in other words, one or a single president? Yes. Yes. And are you both aware that Article 2 of our Constitution makes the President the Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy of the United States? Yes. Yes. And Secretary Esper, are you aware that the President's power to remove office cabinet officials from key national security positions, including the Secretary of Defense, is undisputed? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Certainly. Are you aware that the president's power to remove from office key cabinet officials, especially in national security positions, including the Secretary of Defense, is undisputed? Yes. And General Milley, are you aware that the Uniform Code of Military Justice, which applies to all uniformed officers, criminalizes mutiny and sedition and soliciting or advising on the commission of mutiny or sedition? Absolutely. Yes. 
And Secretary Esper, are you aware of the fundamental proposition that the Secretary of Defense is selected by the legitimate president? Yes, and confirmed by the Senate. And that the legitimate commander-in-chief is the one who oversees the chain of command, correct? Yes. Yes. So finally, the Insurrection Act states that whenever the president considers that unlawful obstructions, combinations, or assemblages, or rebellion against the authority of the United States makes it impracticable to enforce the laws of the United States in any state by the ordinary course of judicial proceedings, he may call into federal service such of the militia of any state and use such of the armed forces as he considers necessary to enforce those laws or to suppress rebellion. Yes? Yes. And unfortunately, the gentlelady is out of time. Um, Mr. Desjardins, I do not see you on the screen. You are next. Okay, we'll go on to Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates, you are recognized for five minutes if you are, in fact, with us. Mr. Bacon, you're usually pretty good at this. Uh, Mr. Bacon, are you on the screen? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate uh, both our Secretary of Defense and our Chairman uh, for your leadership and uh, have the utmost respect for you all. I wanted to just ask if you can say it. The re this report on the bounties, did it originate from an intelligence uh, agency within the military, like the DIA, or was this from outside of the military? I'm, I'm sorry, Congressman. I, I didn't hear the question. Did, did you ask it? The, uh, the intelligence report that talks about the Russian bounties in Afghanistan, did that come from outside of the DOD, like CIA or NSA, or is this uh, like DIA? Or, uh, did it come from a military intelligence agency? It was not produced by a DOD intelligence agency. Okay, I, I thank you for that. I just, because I, I go back to what Ms. Stefanik said, these leaks, I think, undermine our intelligence com communities and it just undermines the confidence of the citizens, either to the president in this case, or uh, depending on what side of the aisle you're on or where you stand, to our intelligence organi organizations themselves. And how active are you in pursuing similar type leaks within DOD? Because uh, I think it's imperative that we start holding people accountable to the maximum extent you know, the law allows. So I'd be just curious for your insights on this. Thank you. Congressman, we are aggressively pursuing leaks within the Defense Department. Uh, we had some, I would categorize as bad leaks last fall. So when I, when we turned the corner of the new year, I made, uh, emphasized on day one of the new year of 2020 that OPSEC was going to be a, 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 a key thing for us to focus on. Leaks continued. I have uh, launched an investigation that is underway to go after leaks, whether it's of, of classified information or unclassified information that is sensitive. And also, you know, unlaw uh, unauthorized discussions with the media. All those things, uh, again, hurt our nas nation's security. They undermine our troops, their, their safety. Uh, they affect our relations with other countries. They undermine our national policy. It, it's bad, and it's happening all over the government, executive branch, legislative branch to some degree. So it's something we need to get control of. And this is not new to this administration. Previous administrations, Republican and Democrat alike, have held, had to deal with this. It's just, it's bad and it's it's unlawful and it needs to stop. Well, thank you, Mr. Secretary. I appreciate your comments there. I, I also liked your comments a couple days ago where I appreciated your transparency, I should say, on the report itself. You said that it was not corroborated, uh, that you didn't have the level of confidence perhaps that the president would get the briefing. Is that still your opinion? It, it is the opinion opinion of a number of intelligence uh, entities, agencies that could not corroborate the report. Hey, thank you. I'm going to uh, switch subjects or topics on you briefly. Could you just go through, or maybe just more for the chairman, uh, what kind of training the Guard gets when it comes to supporting law enforcement? Is it universal to all the Guard members or is it to certain specialties? How does that work? Thank you. Uh, great question. The uh, Na National Guard, as Secretary said up front, that now really we're talking about uh, Air Force Police and the Army National Guard uh, as part of their mission essential task list. Uh, most of the ground units uh, will be trained explicitly in uh, civil disturbance and support of law enforcement. Uh, those would be infantry units and 
um, but primarily military police, and the, and the D.C. Guard explicitly is trained in that. In addition to that, you get refresher training throughout the, throughout the year and throughout their uh, weekend drills, et cetera. So they are trained, not every single guardsman, not every single unit, uh, but the ground force units that are most likely to work in the civil disturbance area or in support of law enforcement are trained. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll just sort of I'll close with just a comment. I, I appreciate the teamwork that the Guard uh, gave uh, the D.C. authorities and also in the other 30-some-odd cities uh, that they were uh, a part of. And what I'm hearing from our local constituents is the, how appalled they are that, you know, that church was burnt, you know, a fire bombed, and the AFL-CIO was torched. Many of the memorials were defaced. And, I, and it was action was needed to be taken uh, and restoring law and order. So I just I appreciate the, what the Guard did to support our law enforcement. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Gallego is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Um, Secretary Esper or, or Jerry Milling, can you explain to us the actual command structure, that was, how it was set up? You know, we had the National Guard working with uh, local police as well as park police. Uh, so how did that happen? Where were, how was the communications between uh, all parties uh, involved uh, and, and who was actually in actual command control of the, that area of Lafayette Square, let's say? Yeah, it's a very good question, Congressman. It's a very, it's, it's not clear. You understand chains of command right. from yep. your service, so it, 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 def it defies that in many ways. So let's, I'll just speak to National Guard under Title 32 uh, for D.C. I already explained it. President to me, yep. to the Secretary of the Army, to the head of Major General Walker. Uh, in support of law enforcement, and law enforcement was both uh, uh, Department of Justice uh, agencies, entities, and Department of Interior, specifically Park Police. Okay. That relationship is more of a cooperative one. It's not something that you and I and others who serve would understand as OPCON or tactical control. It's more of a cooperative relationship where the law enforcement would say, look, we would, you would help us if you were here, here, and here, right. and then we would, we would agree or not agree to do that. But it was a very good relationship that made that work out. Okay. And then, and, of course, any guard units coming into the city right. remain under the control of the governors, but also reported to General Walker, but more, again, on a cooperative, I, I'll call it cooperative con, right. than a traditional military relationship. And so that being said, uh, the deployment of the National Guard uh, in front of Lafayette Square, the day of the incident on June 1st, there was an agreement between, generally, if you could uh, answer this, at some point there was a discussion that the National Guard should stay here in a static position uh, and on this day. So there was a conversation. Who was that conversation between? I'm not sure specifically who, but I think it was probably Secretary McCarthy and General Walker mm -hmm. uh, and the uh, Department of Justice, uh, perhaps Attorney General Barr or okay. representatives uh, in, in, or the representatives of the Department of Interior and the Park Police, perhaps Park Police kept them. I'm not sure the specific individuals. I can find that out, though, and get back to Yep, I'd appreciate it. Uh, and then how, what, what was the method of communication? Because we're dealing cross agencies. Uh, what were they talking over cell phones to each other? Uh, you know, how, how did we actually communicate uh, across all these agencies, especially you know, considering the tense situation that everyone was dealing with? Yes, yeah, you good. Well, I was going to say there was a command post uh, set up, a combined command post uh, with all the different agencies. Eleven, uh, you know, you had the Metropolitan Police represented there, the Park Police with Department of Interior, Secret Service, FBI, DEA, ATF, Capitol Police, Bureau of Prisons, U.S. Mm. Marshals, and various counties from around Arlington, or various police force from around Arlington County, plus the D.C. Guard. They're all located in the FBI right. building. So they did the larger coordination there. Uh, and then uh, on the very, at the various monuments, for example, that's Department of Interior, mm -hmm. uh, and that's Park Police with the D.C. Guard. Just specific to Lafayette Square. They would Square. communicate cell phone, cell phone and or they would be co-located face-to-face. Mm -hmm. Uh, and one guy would have the, a radio for his particular agency, yep. and the other guy would have a radio for his. So, and the National Guards were largely, when, they're, when we were communicating to the National Guard, that was done over radio? Uh, I think it's a combination. Combination. Yeah, I think it would be a combination. Could we, could we also figure that out, too? What was sure. the method yeah, of communication? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And lastly, and if... If there's ground communication, yep. and there's, you know... There's the Especially if there, and there was any communication over radio through the National Guard, uh, the National Guard, that the National Guard used, I'm assuming that we have a transcript of the conversations that were happening. Um, that I'm not so sure. I, I don't could know you, if there's actually... Could you check on that also? I, I, if it's a military communication, yep. I doubt there's a transcript, just if it's a radio. 
I may be wrong, but I, I doubt it. Can you, generally, can you check sure. to see if there's yeah, any yeah, recordings we'll, we'll, specific yeah, sure. to the date of June 1st? Yep. Or any other, uh, or any other recordings that Police the DOD have? Police do that. I'm not so sure about the, but I, we, can, we can find out. We right. can get it. Yeah. Thank you. I yield back in time. Thank you. And actually, I do have one follow-up question. Do, do you, either of you know who specifically gave the order to clear the protesters out of Lafayette Square ahead of the president's visit to the church on June 1st? You said the guard was in support. Who gave the order uh, and to whom, I guess, to clear the protesters out of that square? We've had that discussion a few times. We had it the other day with uh, Secretary McCarthy and Major General Walker, and it's still unclear to me who gave the direction to clear the park at that moment in time. See, I find that hard to believe. I'm, I'm sorry, but it's like a pretty big decision. A lot of people there, everyone's there, and it just sort of happened. No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying I don't know. I have never inquired. I've never pursued it with anybody because we, you know, you get caught up in other things more relevant to. Well, how did you know to have the guard hold back? Because I think there's a lot of testimony that says the guard did not participate in the clearing of the yeah, square. I, Why did they not participate? I think, Congressman, that's the, we, we could actually get something from General Walker. Uh, I, I want to say, I don't want to quote him. I don't want to get it wrong, but I want to say that he was on the ground with the park police and it, it, what they had asked him to do was to stay static, not move, and that was what he was operating from. I, I don't know in okay. that moment when he decided to move forward, but he was on the ground. He, I, I know he told me that yesterday uh, or the day before and was clear on that piece. But beyond that, I, maybe we get something from him to share with you. Chair, Chairman Miller, do you have anything? Yeah, I mean, I that? think uh, I, I don't know with certainty, but I, I'm pretty sure that there was a a uh, planning session down at the FBI building in, in little late morning, around noonish or early afternoon, uh, where they divided up who was going to do what to whom. Major General Walker's there, Secretary McCarthy's there, and there's some others there. And I think that's where the agreement was as to where they would be. Uh, as to who gave the order, I don't know. Uh, I know Attorney General Barr spoke to that uh, publicly, uh, and I know that uh, it's been mentioned Park Police Captain, et cetera. I do not have personal knowledge as to who gave that actual okay. order to clear the park. Th thank you. Uh, Mr. Whitman, you're recognized for five minutes. Sorry, didn't mean to surprise you there. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank our witnesses for joining us today. Um, General Milley, I'd like to go into a little, little more depth. You answer the question about the training that our National Guardsmen have in no, no. responding to situations like we've seen here recently. As we know, most Americans associate National Guard with response to natural disasters and that sort of role. They're not used to seeing guardsmen in the role that we've seen them recently. You talked about some units being trained uh, for that direct contact, but are there instances where a guard unit may be called up that doesn't have that particular training, or do they, do, do they get the training across the full scope of what they may face? I understand how to... Be, how to how to organize, how to tactically address the situation. But there are other things too, you know, the element of controlling emotions, all those sorts of things, which are, you know, the, I call it the depth of training. It's not just, just the uh, immediate tactical, but it's the depth of training to understand, mm -hmm. hey, if you get in this situation, we see police uh, sure. go through that training all the time to be able to deal with the adrenaline and the emotions of the, of the situation. Give us a little idea, a little more in depth. I know you talked about that. But yeah, I mean, the, yeah. your first. National Guard unit of choice for yes. civil unrest is, military, yes. is police. Mm -hmm. and, and remember, a lot of these guardsmen are also cops in their civilian life. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but they'll get very specific training on the, the rules on the use of force. Uh, they're, they're not cops at the moment in time, right. so they're not going to conduct arrests, but they can do temporary mm -hmm. detention. Uh, they're, they're tasked with things like rules of conduct, crowd control, de-escalation procedures, mm -hmm. uh, how to make an appearance, don't react to verbal, uh, don't react to verbal uh, uh, provocations, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's a wide variety of training they go through. A lot of it's vignette training and scenario training and STX type training. They do that during the course of the year. Mm -hmm. um, and then in this particular case, they got quick refresher training as well. Right. Uh, and they're trained on their equipment and so on and so forth. Um, and in this particular case, you're looking at batons and shields and and then their personal protective gear, none of them had any weapons downtown uh, or, or right there at the Lafayette Square. So, but they're trained in all of that stuff. Right. Uh, and, and they are the force, the, the military force mm -hmm. that we would first call for civil unrest would be National Guard Military Police. 
Sure. And then you'd go from there with other types of units. Okay, very good. Secretary Esper, I want to ask you a little bit about the, the 1033 program. It obviously, through time to time, gets a lot of attention with the equipment that is formerly used by the military that would be available to civilian law enforcement. And the question is, is you know, does that militarize the, uh, the police force? Uh, the questions always surround the central point of, do civilian police forces need that? And what connection is there to the military being requested for that equipment and the determination they, they make as to whether or not it's, it's applicable for that to be sent to a civilian police force. Can you give us a little more lay down about what happens with the 1033 program? And does it just include the big equipment we hear about or is it things like a protective equipment like vests and those, those sorts of uh, pieces of equipment? Yeah, Congressman, it's, as you know, it's a congressional program, right. and uh, it's, it's not something I've studied in much detail, and I don't think I could speak to what law enforcement deems as its requirements. Uh, it is something that I spoke with uh, General Langell uh, about the other day, and it's something that I hope will be, that may come up as part of the after action review mm -hmm. to get their assessment, if not internal, but with law enforcement. But there is a wide range of items that are covered under that program. Uh, I, I can't pass judgment on some of the things. I, I would say, I, I think we could all generally agree that if we have body armor, that would be helpful to the police to protect them. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, I'd like to wait and see how our review comes out, or if you have specific questions, I could take back and, and maybe see if the guard wants to take a look at it or somebody like that. Okay. Very good. General Milley, any, yeah, any I would, comments? I, I would say that, um, like in the case of D.C., with all of those different forces, uniforms, just simple uniforms as opposed to mm -hmm. other types of equipment, that became an issue and was brought up a little early with the Bureau of Prisons. Our guys are wearing, you know, uh, camouflage uniforms, et cetera. Um, some of these police are in blue uniforms, other in camouflage, other in solid green, et cetera. Uh, that became, in terms of the lessons learned, that would be something I'd put in there uh, mm -hmm. a, 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 as far as distinguishing character. Because you want a clear definition between that which is military and that which is police, yes. in my view. Uh, and, and consistently, you want police, local police, uh, state police, federal police, dealing with law enforcement stuff. Uh, and if necessary, National Guard under governor control. But you want a clear distinction, that which is police, visual, yes. a visual distinction, that which is police and that which is military. Because when you start introducing the military, you're talking a different uh, level of effort there. I'm sorry, the gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Esper is waving at me. What Do you have quick there? Just real quick, one of the things that we discussed the other day that, needs, that I want to address is uh, in terms of equipment. At one point, the National Guard, for example, cross-leveled its, its riot shields and lent them to the law enforcement. So if you saw police out there using a military police shield, it's because we cross-leveled it. And that's a lesson learned. Yeah. But if you're going to do that, then we've got to figure out a way to mask the name military police so we don't confuse who is actually doing the crowd control. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Malton is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman. I learned very early in my Marine training that there are two types of courage, physical and moral. And usually the toughest challenges that I face in Iraq required moral courage. And Mr. Chairman, your apology for the events of June 1st at St. John's Church was an act not just of contrition, and rightly so, but also an act of moral courage. And I want to commend you for that. It's certainly unusual in this administration. Mr. Chairman, you clearly recognize the value of unity, not just in our military, but in our country. Do you believe that other countries, our various adversaries around the world, are interested in taking advantage of divisions and unrest in our country? I not only believe that they would, uh, I know they are. Mr. Chairman, are you willing to elaborate on that sure. in any detail? Um, it would be best to do that in a classified session. But Very well. I have no doubt in my mind that foreign adversarial countries are trying to take advantage of civil unrest in the United States. Well, I think it should go without saying that in fulfilling your primary job description to provide forthright military advice to the President, I strongly advise you to advise him to work to sew up these divisions rather than exacerbate them as he likes to do as Secretary Mattis and others have described in intimate detail. Uh, Mr. Secretary, turning to you, I, I don't think you get to pick and choose which leaks you like, which leaks aren't damaging versus what is an OPSEC problem. This White House routinely uses leaks to their advantage, 
but suddenly it's a problem for their apologists. Now, you and I have both commanded troops in combat, been responsible for their force protection. So I can assure you that I also don't care about the mere semantics of an intelligence report and whether or not a particular word was used or not used. That proves nothing. What matters is the substance. And I have never seen in my time in combat when we didn't take any threat to our troops seriously, regardless of the confidence in the intelligence re report, which is never 100%. Whether it was leaked or not, we take action. So a very simple question. When were you made aware of Russian material support for, of the Taliban, who we all know have been killing American troops in Afghanistan for years, and what action did you take? Congressman, let me say on the first part, though, of your, of your statement, you talked about uh, uh, credibility of threats and all that. As, as you've heard us say that the reports uh, were not, have not been corroborated, Nonetheless, uh, that, may, my understanding is that some intelligence agencies believe that there's not general consensus on that. The, all the defense, but the bottom line is all the defense intelligence agencies have been unable to corroborate that report. Uh, but to your, one of the points you made, let me say this: you may have seen my written statement that was put out on my behalf. What I said was, regardless, we we do, I do, he does. The commanders take all reports seriously regardless of the degree of credibility or confidence. And I think that's the point you were trying to make. And I want to, I want to reassure you of that. Uh, so I, we have been in discussions with the commanders about this. Uh, I know General Miller and General McKenzie going back as early as January. Uh, we're looking into this, pulling the threads, taking uh, appropriate force protection measures. Our troops are already um, at the highest force protection level. Uh, but nonetheless, it's something that when I talk to them, I talk to them all the time about how do we, how can we do better, how can we do more. So, Mr. Secretary, you mentioned January. Right. What action did you take to counter Russia? Not to improve force protection of our troops, but to directly counter this threat from Russia. Yeah, so I didn't see the first report until February when it came out uh, in an uh, in a, in a, in a intelligence piece of paper. Uh, McKen I think General McKenzie and General Miller, uh, the chairman will help me here, uh, got some initial reporting on the ground that they began pursuing. Neither thought the reports were credible as they dug into them. And I, I, in the time we have, I'd see General Miller was, uh, General M Milley might be able to kind of add some more color to that. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to go too deep into the, the actual intel, but I've got multiple tours in Afghanistan, uh, as you know, Congressman, and, and I'm, I've been aware of Russian meddling for years. I understand, back, but my going question back to 2013 is, or so. what action did you take? Well, specifically, uh, at the tactical and operational military action, uh, there is no military action that that intelligence specifically warranted, like conduct a raid or go after I, I, I understand, but at the strategic level. But now at the I do apologize, sorry, but the gentleman's time ha ha has expired, and that's not a question that I think is going to be answered in the next couple of seconds, so we'll have to take that for the record and get back to I'll you. get you an answer. I'll yes. give you an explicit answer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Gates. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General Milley, I'll allow you to respond to Congressman Moulton specifically as it relates to the depth, duration, and extent of the Russian malign influence campaign in Afghanistan and, and perhaps the extent to which that well predates the current administration? Well, first I want to be clear. It's not just Russia. That there's many other countries that are uh, influencing various actors in Afghanistan. Uh, and they are influencing them with training, money, weapons, uh, propaganda, and uh, international support, and a lot of other things. Uh, and I'm not going to go into source and methods how we know that, but we know that. Uh, with respect to Russia, Russia is one of those countries that's been doing that for years. And they're doing it for their own reasons. Uh, the military action for us, and they're doing it through the Taliban and Haqqani and other groups. So the military action for us is the issue, first and foremost, is force protection. Regardless of who's providing weapons or who's providing money, our force protection measures are at the highest levels, and they're going to stay at the highest levels as long as we have troops out there. Uh, oh, so, but, but just so that I could focus the but, question. But okay. I want to go to what we're doing for action. So at the tactical and operational level, there's no particular military action that we're not doing that we should be doing. The issue is higher than that. The issue is at the strategic level. What should or could we be doing at the strategic level? 
Is there diplomatic and informational and economic? Are there sanctions? Are there demarches? Uh, are there phone calls? Are there pressure? Those sorts of things. And I can tell you that some of that is done. Uh, are we doing as much as we could or should? Perhaps not. Not only to the Russians, but to others. But a lot of it is being done. Uh, some of it's quiet. Some of it's not so quiet. Uh, but don't think that we're not doing anything, because that's not true. Uh, now, I want to get to specifically to the bounties, specifically to the bounties. That is a unique, discrete piece of information that is not corroborated. You've all been briefed on it. I have too, and I am, I and the Secretary and many others are taking it serious. We're going to get to the bottom of it. We're going to find out if, in fact, it's true, and if it is true, we will take action. And I'm glad you mentioned the other countries. Uh, September 5th, 2010, this is from uh, the Times of London. Iran pays the Taliban to kill U.S. soldiers. That's right. Uh, then also following up on that, there's a December 2nd, 2015 report from Fox News, report Iran paying Taliban to kill U.S. troops. Mr. Chairman, I seek unanimous consent to enter these in the record. Without objection, so ordered. And uh, General Milley, uh, is, it, is it safe to say, given these reports along with the testimony you just provided, that the environment in Afghanistan, the very nature of the place and the very nature of the entities involved means that our presence there does create these risks where our foreign adversaries create incentives and resources and opportunities for our service members to uh, be harmed. Anytime you commit U.S. military forces anywhere on earth, there's going to be risk. Uh, we went to Afghanistan for a single purpose, to prevent Afghanistan from ever being a platform to attack the United States of America with terrorists. Uh, and we've been there ever since to do that. Uh, we are drawing down forces in accordance with the uh, agreement that was signed with the Taliban last February. There hasn't been significant Taliban or Haqqani attacks on U.S. forces since that agreement was signed. And per the direction of the President of the United States, we are drawing down forces, as you'll see unfold, and you'll be briefed on that in full uh, coming into the fall. Uh, but there's always risk, Congressman, and, and I know you know that. There's always risk. There's nothing risk-free here. It's, it's a risk I know you both appreciate, given your service to the country. It's a risk I know the President appreciates. Uh, I've, I've had the occasion to join him at Dover when my constituents have come right. back. For dignified transfer and, and that risk being so ever present, it present seems to accentuate the importance of your mission to draw down troops, to create some semblance of, of normalcy in Afghanistan to the extent to which that's even possible. And, and I believe that it is an unrealistic goal to say that we have to chase every terrorist into every cave forever and stay there forever in order to protect the homeland. I think that we've proven that we can be more resilient at home without being more extended abroad, and that after 19, 20 years in Afghanistan, our nation is growing very weary of this. We're growing weary of the dignified transfers. We're growing weary of the cost in terms of blood and treasure. And we grow weary of these circumstances where our adversaries, not just Russia, but Iran and others that are in the region, utilize our continued presence they utilize our, our, might I say, you know, unfocused extension of this conflict uh, to try to harm Americans. So I, I wish you Godspeed in the mission that you're on to draw down those forces. And I uh, thank you for giving us the briefing and certainly for enlightening us to the fact that this was not some... Gentleman's time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Carbajal is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Milley, um, and Secretary Esper, thank you for joining us today to cover these very important issues. Before I get to my questions, I want to take a moment to mention Specialist Vanessa Gillian, Gillian, who disappeared from Port Hood in April after confiding in her family that she had been sexually harassed by a sergeant. Her remains were tragically found a few days ago. I'm sure you're both aware of her story. I and expect that you will do everything in your power to ensure that a full and independent investigation is completed and continue to work to make our military welcoming and safe for our female service members. As for today's topics, what have you noted in your test testimonies, our country is going through a period of anger and self-reflection regarding how our society treats and includes certain members of our nation. While I appreciate your words, actions speak louder. Secretary Esper, what concrete steps have you already taken and what other immediate actions do you plan on taking in the coming months to ensure that diversity is substantially valued 
and increase at all levels of our military, especially amongst the officer ranks. Congressman, thank you. And first of all, uh, you mentioned Specialist Guillen. What a terrible tragedy, murder. Uh, it's just a horrible, uh, tragic story, and I feel for the family, and they have my deepest sympathies and condolences, and we will conduct a full and thorough investigation and get to the bottom of all that happened and hold those uh, accountable as appropriate. Uh, with that, your, your question is, uh, is, is spot on. Look, we recognize that race is a problem in the military across the nation, discrimination, prejudice, bias. Uh, I talked about my uh, uh, quick, uh, quick action items. Uh, I have a list. I'll probably put that out next week in terms of immediate things that we will do to start uh, getting rid of uh, uh, hidden bias in the military, such as removing photographs from promotion boards. But I've also had the privilege over the last three weeks to hold over a half dozen listening sessions with soldiers, uh, sailors, airmen of all ranks across the country and simply listen. Beginning the conversation alone is something we've never really done. And the chance to sit down with these young men and women, I probably spent a total of 10 hours or so just listening, having the having discussion, understanding that we don't even have the right terms and language and understandings of the definitions to have such a tough conversation. And I sat through many of them. So that'll be, that'll be part of what we're going to begin. But I, I, I think in terms of standing up the defense board and ultimately the Defense Advisory Committee that is mirrored on Dakowitz, I want to believe in some ways it's an historic step, a major step forward to really get at this underlying issue that has uh, hung around the neck of our country for, for uh, well over 200 years and to address the fundamental problems of racism and discrimination, prejudice and bias, both conscious and unconscious, because at the end of the day for DOD, it's about having a cohesive, unified, ready force, and we rely heavily on persons from all backgrounds, creeds, races, ethnicities, genders, uh, et cetera, to make us the greatest fighting force in the world. Thank you, Secretary Esper. I want to ask another question. General Milley and Secretary Esper, uh, I would like to also take a moment to uh, commend you uh, uh, regarding the statements you made uh, uh, at Lafayette Square, being there in field fatigues. Uh, you state that it was a mistake and you learn from it. I believe over the last month, there are many moments we can all learn from. Regret is one thing, but what would you do different in a similar situation? And while I understand we are winning reports on specific instances, such as the low-flying uh, National Guard helicopters and reconnaissance planes, uh, what lessons has the department learned uh, about its response? And how, would you, uh, how are you both working to make improvements? You know, Congressman, one of the, uh, you go back to the June 1st, the evening of June 1st, it became apparent to me late that evening, I think uh, Chairman Amelia and I had spent a couple hours walking around D.C. speaking to the soldiers. We were at the World War II Memorial and the Jefferson Memorial, and it, it uh, you know, became very clear that uh, we needed to speak on this topic. And uh, if you recall, and I think I entered into the record, Mr. Chairman, already, I put a, I put a statement out to the force within 18 hours or so that said very clearly, uh, that we have an oath to the Constitution, and that is our sworn oath to protect and defend the American people and to give the American people the freedom to peaceably assemble and offer their, their, their speech, and that we at all times must do our best to remain an apolitical institution. That, I believe, is why we have the highest regard and respect in the country and have maintained that but, for many years. Ms. Mr. Carbajal, your time is, you I apologize. Mr. Carbajal, your, your time has expired. Uh, Ms. Hartzell, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. First of all, I want to commend you for the amazing professional job that uh, you all have done, especially the National Guardsmen, in very, very difficult situations. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you just mentioned uh, the, the oath to defend uh, our First Amendment rights. And just to review that, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of the religion or prohibiting the free exercise the, thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievance. What I have seen and what this country has witnessed in the last few weeks, I would argue, has not been peaceable in many times. And the National Guardsmen, these brave men and women who've, who have volunteered and left their home to protect their country, they have faced with only batons and shields 
They've been yelled at, called names that are unbelievable. They've had bricks thrown at them. They've been shoved. They've had frozen water bottles thrown at them. I've seen on TV fireworks being shot at them. And they have stood there. They have professionally taken it. They have defended uh, our monuments and our, our treasures. And I just want to commend them. At the same time, I want to denounce these actions of some Americans. And this is violence. This is not peaceably assembling. And it should be treated as, as such. And we've had questions about training. And Mr. Secretary, I know you were just at Fort Leonard Wood a couple of weeks ago. And our community was so thrilled to, to host you. And uh, I know that you have seen our missions there, including being home of the Army's military police school. And uh, hopefully you've seen that we have room to expand. And we've heard a little bit about the training. Uh, I'm wondering if you think it would be um, helpful to have centralized training to ensure consistency uh, across all of the armed forces in military police uh, actions, civil unrest um, behaviors? And it, it's, it's a good, good question, Congresswoman. I'd, I'd like to take that back, uh, certainly for the National Guard and how they train. Um, you know, it is very important that, it, particularly for the Guard that has this as a mission essential task to, to make sure that we have a, a solid baseline. But I like, to, I like to be deliberate and thoughtful on these things and get back yeah. to you. Well, on thank that. you. Uh... Typically, Congresswoman, it, it, it's not going to be possible to do centralized training given the scale of the military in terms of the numbers. So what is typically done is training is centrally planned, the task conditions and standards, training and doctrine commands of each of the services lay out all the requirements, uh, and then it is distributed for execution by unit commanders. That's for the forces that are in the operational force. All of the units in all of the different services go through the training schoolhouse. Uh, so having one central location for all things civil disturbance, that can be okay for doctrine, uh, for tasks, conditions, standards, to, to, to lay that out, and that is typically what, the, what everyone does. But then the execution of the actual training, that needs to be more decentralized and distributed. All right, thank you. Uh, the Insurrection Act has been mentioned as well, and uh, you were asked a lot of questions where you're supposed to ask yes or no, so I'll, I'll carry on that for just one uh, more question. Do you realize that the Insurrection Act was not acted on in, this recent, in the recent days? Yes. Yes. Okay. Now that we have that clear, um, could there be scenarios in the future for a president where perhaps a insurrection act might be um, utilized and, and could be helpful? Congressman, let me answer this way. Rather than speculating and offer, let me, let me offer history. The insurrection act was used in 1957 by President Eisenhower to uh, federalize the guard in Arkansas and to also call up the 101st Airborne Division in order to protect nine African-American students, known as the Little Rock Nine, so they can go to school. It was called up in 1962 by President Kennedy to federalize the Mississippi National Guard to secure the University of Mississippi, Oxford, in order to ensure James Meredith, an African-American Air Force veteran, could go to school. The military police remained there for over a year. In 1965, President Johnson deployed active duty forces to protect peaceful protest marchers in Alabama to ensure that they could protest peacefully uh, opposing, I believe, segregation and their, uh, affirming their First Amendment rights. So if you look at history, you can see where the Re Insurrection Act was used to advance civil rights, and in a very positive way that our history accounts fairly well. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Brown is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have uh, two questions. Uh, I will ask them quickly, and I hope that you can answer them briefly. The first for you, General Milley. I know that you are a student of history, history of warriors and warfare of the United States and our armed forces, and that you use that knowledge and understanding of our history to guide your decisions and thinking. You not only understand, but you embody the values that we live by and that we die by as soldiers. Can you comment on the naming of army installations after Confederate soldiers? Does it reflect the values that we instill in soldiers? Are these Confederate officers held up as role models in today's military? Does it help or hurt the morale or unit cohesion of service members, particularly that of the black and brown service members who live and serve on these installations today? Congressman, um, we've had a lot of discussions in the Department of Defense and in the Joint Chiefs and amongst the senior leaders on that very topic. 
Um, I'll, I'll give you um, a couple of things to think about. I, I, I personally uh, think that the original decisions to name those bases after Confederate generals, the 10 bases you're talking about in the Army, uh, those were political decisions back in the 1910s and 20s and 30s and World War I, World War II time for 100 years ago. Uh, and they're going to be political decisions today. Uh, the military equity here is divisiveness. Uh, and as you mentioned, cohesion. 43% uh, of the United States military uh, are minorities. Uh, and uh, uh, in the Army, for example, and these are Army bases you're talking about, uh, we're up uh, to 20 plus percent African American. And in some units, you'll see 30%. And for those young soldiers that go on to a base, uh, a Fort Hood or a Fort Bragg or a Fort wherever named after a Confederate general, uh, they can be reminded that that general fought for an institution of slavery that may have enslaved uh, one, of their, one of their ancestors. I had a staff sergeant when I was a young officer who actually told me that at Fort Bragg. Uh, and he said he went to work every day on a base that uh, represented a guy who enslaved his grandparents. So, the symbols of the, it's not just the, you know, we have to improve the substance of promotions, et cetera, in the military. But we've also got to take a hard look at the symbology, the symbols. Things like Confederate flags and statues and bases and all that kind of stuff. The, the Confederate, the Confederacy, the American Civil War uh, was fought. Uh, and, and it was an act of rebellion. It was an act of treason at the time uh, against the Union, against the Stars and Stripes, against the U.S. Constitution. And those officers turned their back on their oath. Uh, now... Uh, some have a different view of that. Some of that. Some think it's heritage. Uh, others think it's hate. Uh, what, the, the way we should do it matters as much as that we should do it. So we need to have, uh, uh, I've recommended, a, a commission of folks to, to take a hard look at the bases, the statues, the names, and all of this stuff to see if we can have a Th rational, you, uh, mature discussion. Thank you, Milley. I appreciate it. I do want to get to uh, okay. Secretary okay. Esper. I got it. Uh, I want to uh, take a moment to thank you, Secretary, for clarifying your position on the use of force and deployment of our military against civilians exercising their constitutional rights to assemble, to petition our government and peacefully protest. Mr. Secretary, as you stated in your June 17th statement, uh, we strive to create an environment of diversity and inclusion in the military. You specifically stated removing bias and prejudice in all its forms and ensuring equal opportunity and respect for all will make us stronger, more capable, and more ready as a joint force. Last month, both the U.S. Marine Corps and U.S. Navy announced plans to ban the Confederate flag and associated imagery on bases and installations around the world. This symbol honors those who fought, as General Milley mentioned, to uh, maintain oppression and, sl and slavery. Furthermore, the Confederate flag is used, albeit not by everyone, but is used by white supremacists and other organizations seeking to spread hate and racism in the end, in racism. In the NDAA, we include a provision to ban its display on, on all department property, but I believe that immediate action should be taken. What is your plan regarding a department-wide ban of this symbol? Thanks, Congressman. First of all, let me, again, uh, you know, echo what you said about the National Guard. And I'm reminded this is a use of force uh, card that was handed out to the D.C. Guard, and here prominently in bold says, remember to preserve the peace and allow fellow Americans to peacefully assemble and exercise their First Amendment rights. That's what our Guard was trained on uh, when they were, when they were uh, operating in, in D.C. Uh, look, we, I, I have a process underway by which to look at a number of issues, uh, both substantive and symbolic. Uh, uh, it'll be a combination of the Defense Board and the Advisory Committee. Uh, we want to take a look at, uh, at, at all those things. Uh, there is a process underway uh, by which we uh, affirm. And I'm sorry, Mr. Secretary, if you could wrap up quickly. The general's time has expired. Which we uh, affirm what, what types of flags are authorized uh, on uh, U.S. military bases. I want to make sure that we have an approach that is enduring, that could withstand legal challenge, but that unites us and most importantly helps build cohesion and readiness and again, that process is underway. And, Thank uh, you. I think that. Yeah, yes, sir. Got the gist. Uh, Mr. Mr. Waltz. Thank you, Mr. Um, Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Waltz, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, General Milley, I just want to commend the Guard. I actually want to commend the Guard for its professional choice 
I'm uh, sorry, Mr. Waltz, you are you are deep in the water here. We cannot understand you. Can you give it one one more quick try or we may have to, to yeah. move on? Okay, how, how are we doing now? Much better, go. I just wanna commend the guard. Uh, my understanding is we have over 70,000, you know, that's roughly six division currently deployed for the homeland and, uh, and, and overseas. Um, uh, that's for COVID, that's for civil unrest, that's for ongoing overseas missions. We haven't even gotten into hurricane season in Florida or wildfires or others. You know, Mr. Secretary, the Guard's defense strategy points to demographic and economic trends that, that are critical uh, to where we have the force structure around the country and says that it must be prepared to reposition Guard force structure uh, in light of those shifting trends, particularly uh, shifting population, which as we know has shifted fairly drastically over the last uh, several decades, yet the force structure hasn't hasn't followed. In fact, in Florida, Florida right now ranks 53 out of 54 states and territories in terms of the size of the guard, the per capita of its population. Yeah, I think we all know with every every hurricane bearing down every season, wildfires and others, how much you can you come back to me uh, for the record? Uh, can you work with Carol uh, with the NGB or I don't know if you hear me, I'm not interfering. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Wallace. Once again, we, we've sort of, Mr. Wallace, we, we can't understand you. I think the first part of your question was reasonably clear. Mr. Esper, if you wanted to take a stab at the, the guard situation in Florida, answer that if you can you can and take a shot at it. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Waltz. Thank you. I, I think from what I caught, I, uh, I, I'll follow up with you offline. I, I think you were talking about the, the disposition or maybe the, the composition of guard forces in Florida and how it's changed over time or not with demographics. So maybe I'll just follow up with you offline. And I think you asked that we have a conversation with uh, General Langell. That's what I took from that. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, if, 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 if you could hear me, just a slight tweak there. Uh, it's, it's nationwide. It's how the Guard is shifting to reflect population flows. Um, particularly, we're looking at the per capita. You know, uh, Florida's population has doubled since the 1980s, yet its Guard has remained stagnant. So that, that, that would be one piece, and then the other piece, uh, I think I'm hearing interference. Yeah, uh, you're, you're breaking up. I apologize. We're, we're going to have to move on. We've, we've got a limited amount of time. We'll get that back back to him, but we cannot hear you properly. Um, so uh, we're going to move on to Mr. Keating. He's recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for your uh, straightforward way you're addressing Lafayette Square issue. and. Uh, civil law enforcement. I appreciate that. I want to circle back uh, before we're done because I know how uh, a video clip can work. Secretary Esper, you were asked, uh, I believe by Mr. Turner, uh, about bounties. And I want to be clear. Uh, the question was asked, uh, was the word bounties used in reports that you might have reviewed regarding uh, attacks on our troops? So let me be clear. Uh, you can acknowledge, since you acknowledge there was no bounties, that Indeed, there were reports that mentioned payments. Is that correct? Uh, Congressman, that's correct. I was responding to the specific question of do I recall use of the word bounties, and I think what I okay. said is I do not re no, do, recall the use no, of that I word. No, I think you answered it uh, correctly, but uh, I didn't want a sound bite at the end of this hearing coming out that said, that you said that you never saw a report on bounties. So that's Congressman, clear. I, I, always, uh, I always try to avoid politics, Congressman. I know. In any case, I didn't want you to be drawn into it unnecessarily. How's that? Uh, in any case, uh, Director Haskell, Haskell, uh, CIA Director Haskell, just in the last few days has said how important it is for uh, force protection that the dissemination of information occurs and is shared to all national security uh, community members, obviously, uh, to you, all of you, in an ongoing effort to secure our troops. So. She also it was underscored clearly that the immediate versus delayed dissemination of that information, intelligence reports, is critical. Are you satisfied that you're getting immediate transfer of this intelligence uh, from our other agencies? So if it's actionable, you can act on that. Uh, can you state that for the record that there's, you don't perceive any delays, that this is really a lifetime dissemination to you? Congressman, I get a lot of reports every day, an inch thick of material I try and get through and read through. I know 
uh, you, the Hill, this committee gets reports as well. You And I think you saw the same reports that I saw on this topic. It, it's, it's hard for me to gauge uh, the timeliness because I don't know when they start or when they get it. But, you know, clearly there's a, a process part of this, an analysis part, that, that once they get information, converting it in and process and converting it into intelligence, all that happens. I just don't have a sense of the timing. But I don't want to interrupt, but I'll follow up with time, her. So I, I can follow up with her on that offline. Please do, because it's, it's essential that you get that information. I also want to know independently, you know, some of these uh, unsourced uh, reports uh, do a lot for family members. Uh, I come from a family where we lost a, a family member in action. And particularly, you know, reports around 2019, the casualties that were there, the, the soldiers we lost. Could you tell us independently, are you looking into uh, those as well, given the intelligence you have, particularly uh, the April uh, 2019 suicide bombing uh, outside of a Graham uh, air base uh, that killed three of our U.S. Marines. Are you looking at least this independently based on the intelligence you have? Uh, Congressman, first of all, I share the concern and uh, condolences still to the family of, of those Marines, I believe, who were lost. Uh, let me say this much, and I'll ask Chairman Milley to, to jump in here. Uh, General McKenzie is looking back uh, over, uh, over time. I, don't, I think he stated publicly as well as he doesn't see causality with that one. And I believe uh, that I got a separate report from one of my intelligence agencies saying they cannot find any corroborating evidence uh, with regard to that uh, alleged program, with regard to that attack on those three Marines. But, Chairman? Congressman, as of today, right now, we don't have cause and effect linkages uh, to a Russian bounty program causing U.S. military casualties. However, we are still looking. Uh, we're not done. We're going to run this thing to ground. Yeah, well, thank you. And, it, and just as clarification from an intelligence standpoint without being wonky, I mean, corroboration usually isn't a term that's used, uh, but it's usually remote, you know, uh, improbable, even odds, probable, highly probable. Those are the kind of, or certain, those are the kind of intelligence terms that, that are done uh, linking things together. Uh, I'll yield back. I'm actually yielding back some time, Mr. Chairman. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Mr. Vila, you are recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Sec Secretary Esper and um, Chairman Milley, uh, I've got two questions, and whatever time is left, I'd like to yield to Ms. Lockett so that she can get ready for that. But my first question refers to uh, Vanessa Guillen that Mr. Uh, Carvajal uh, brought up. And what I'd like to do um, is, I'm sure you're both as disturbed as we all are uh, by the events leading to her death. And what I'd like to do is give you an opportunity uh, her, her, she has family members in my district and would like to give you the opportunity uh, to, to tell uh, that family um, what we're going to do to make sure that those sorts of things don't happen again. Congressman, let me first uh, go first and speak uh, uh, to you, but more importantly, the family, and just express our sin sincere condolences with regard to what happened to Specialist Guillaume. Uh, it's, it's tragic. It's horrible. Uh, I, I watched this uh, over the preceding couple months in terms of how it unfolded. I can't imagine the despair of the parents uh, not knowing what their, uh, the fate of their daughter. And uh, it, it's just a, a terrible incident. Um, I spoke yesterday uh, or the day before with Secretary McCarthy. Uh, they're on top of that. Uh, as you know, they have a, a couple suspects, uh, I, I think, have been arrested. Uh, and they are dig digging deeply into the investigation. I think we need to uh, continue to pursue that and take a hard look at that. And then, uh, you know, we can got to continue to work at the uh, at what is believed to be the an underlying issue, the underlying issue, and that was uh, she was sexually harassed, if not assaulted, by uh, the soldier in question. Uh, that is something that is continues to be uh, a stain on um, on the on the profession. And we've we've made a lot of progress over 10 years. But nowhere near we need to be. Uh, we need to get to zero tolerance of sexual harassment and sexual assault. And we need to make sure that everybody in our ranks uh, knows where they can go to for help, where they can find help. And we got to continue to emphasize that. We got to continue to empower the chain of command and make sure we do everything possible to make sure that we never have another incident uh, like what happened to uh, Specialist Gihan. Uh, and, and so that is my commitment, and uh, uh, I know it's the chairman's commitment as well. Chairman? 
Yeah, I would echo everything the Secretary said. I, as a father um, of a daughter, uh, that, that, that's just a nightmare. I mean, it's a, my heart bleeds for that family, um, and I can't even begin to imagine uh, what they're going through. Uh, but I want them to know that we're going to do everything in our power to make sure that that doesn't happen again. Um, I don't know all the details. The full investigation will come out by Secretary McCarthy. Uh, I suspect, although I don't know, that there were probably some missed signals. Um, and one of the key lessons that we've learned uh, in other situations is when we do get early warning, uh, it's to take action uh, and take action swiftly and appropriately. Uh, so I think that will, my guess is that will probably come out in this case. Uh, and that will be one of the things we need to implement for the future to make sure it doesn't happen again. Well, th thanks to both of you. Uh, my other question uh, is for you, Secretary Esper, and you recently extended the deployment of 4,000 troops uh, to, the, to the southern border. Uh, and what I'm wondering is, and, and just today in the Rio Grande Valley, uh, the hospitals were forced to set up tents uh, to serve as ICU units. And I'm wondering if there is any consideration being given uh, to using those troops to help support uh, local efforts to confront the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, Congressman, I'll answer your question two ways. Uh, first, first of all, you're, you're right, we did extend, reduced it, but extended the deployment. We're there, as you know, in support of the Department of Homeland Security, and as they give us uh, uh, mission statements, we try and re be responsive and supportive of, of what they do. In this case, if they need additional m medical support, that is clearly something that we, we can provide if needed. I think beyond that, and, and unless I misunderstood your question, uh, we, cert we are now reacting to uh, incoming requests from FEMA. I spoke to uh, Director Gaynor the other night with regard to COVID spikes in Texas, throughout Texas. As you may or may not know, we have already deployed a team of medical personnel to s assist in Texas, and we are on the alert and looking for outbreaks in other states such as uh, Arizona, Florida, uh, California, to make sure that we are responsive to the American people in terms of dealing with uh, any outbreaks that may happen around the country. And the gentleman's time has, has expired. Um, Mr. Kim is recognized. Thank you so much for coming out here and talking to us today. As you've referred to earlier, uh, many of us uh, uh, members were briefed here in this room earlier today about, uh, about the intelligence and about what we know about uh, possible Russian payments uh, to the Taliban or militants to kill American soldiers and service members in Afghanistan. Uh, I have to tell you, leaving aside the, the discussions about whether or not there is sufficient evidence regarding possible bounties or payments, whatever we want to call it. Uh, I have to say that the, the intelligence and what we know about Russian efforts in Afghanistan were large targeting our personnel uh, is deeply concerning to me. And General Milley, you made reference to this, saying that this is something that we've known for quite some time and, and quite a number of years. Uh, I just wanted to ask this question. I couldn't help but while I'm in this room getting this brief and think about a previous time that we've been in this exact room together uh, at the beginning of this year, talking about Iran. And at that time, Secretary Esper and others were talking about how there was a threat to our personnel with regards to uh, our personnel in Iraq and the region due to Iranians and Iranian-backed militias. So I want to just hear from you. Both of these instances of what we know, what we do know about Russia's involvement in Afghanistan, both of them involved another nation arming and directing militants to kill American service members or target American service members abroad. Yet I see two very different reactions to this coming from, uh, from you, from the administration. So I wanted to ask for your explanation of what is the difference in the posture there between what our conversations in January as what we're having today. Secretary Esper. So Congressman, I think they are very two, two very different situations. So with regard to Iran, you had a case of the head of the IRGC, which is designated by the United States as a foreign terrorist organization. He was the foreign terrorist leader of that foreign terrorist organization. He had the blood of a hundred, hundreds of Americans going back many, many years on his hands. He had orchestrated the rocket attacks that had proceeded, uh, that had occurred in that December. And we had clear, credible, credible information that he was planning additional attacks 
on American personnel in the region. So a very different circumstance between what we saw, the evidence we had, our understanding of the threat in, 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 uh, in uh, Iraq that was being, on that battlefield that was being orchestrated by Soleimani, and it was the clear consensus of the President's national security team uh, that, uh, that he was a legitimate target. Again, very different from information we're picking up uh, with regard to uh, Russia, et cetera. But, Chairman, I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah, to I want to uh, key on something you said, Congressman. Um, we've been aware for some time of Russian involvement or Iranian involvement or Pakistani or Chinese involvement in other countries. Uh, but there's a big distinction between arming and directing. We know about arms, we know about weapons, we know about support and things like that. We don't have, in the case of the Russians, we do not have concrete corroborating evidence, uh, intelligence, uh, to show directing. And that's a big difference. Um, and if we did, there'd be a different response too. So, uh, but that's what I'm saying, we're not done looking. We're gonna dig into this. We're gonna get to the bottom of it, this bounty thing. Uh, I'm, I'm, if in fact there's bounties, uh, I am I'm an outraged general, just like every one of us in uniform is. If, in fact, there's bounties directed by the government of Russia or any of their institutions to kill American soldiers, that's a big deal. That's a real big yeah. deal. We don't have that level of fidelity yet. We're still looking. Well, we'll continue to go through the intelligence with you. Regardless of whether the payments were made, I felt that there was significant information there about directing. But again, we'll continue that conversation going forward. Congressman, just, just curious, were you able to get the briefing today? I did. Okay, That's good. That's right. Good. Uh, just one last question. Uh, when we talked about the, the National Guard being utilized, uh, you were talking, General Milley, about the training that they often get. Yet, when we looked at it, uh, out of the 5,100 guards, guardsmen and women who were here in D.C. Uh, last month. Only uh, 154 from the D.C. National Guard were military police, 26 security forces. From other states, only 83 were military police and four were security forces. That's 5% out of the 5,100. Uh, Secretary Esper, when you sent out your notice of emergency deployment, you focused on active duty military police units. Why was that not done the same for our guardsmen in terms of prioritizing military police personnel? And this will have to conclude. Um, I understand the secretary has has to go. Um, we are over time, um, so up to you how long you wish to answer that that question, and then we're we, we will be done. Go ahead. Uh, probably the chairman may be better situated, but there, you know every soldier undergoes a certain level of training, and of course we would not uh, ask them to perform a mission if they weren't briefed on the rules of engagement and had a basic level of training. But your your point is a fair one: is we try and prioritize. As the chairman noted earlier, the, the best for these situations would be military police units. Uh, but you also have to go with what you have available at the time to do that. And that's why I'm so proud of our guardsmen who were, in many cases, performing missions that weren't core missions, but were a core mission as a soldier or an airman. Thank you. I will say there were a lot of members who do not have an opportunity to question. I understand the, the secretary does have to go. We would like to have the opportunity to submit those questions for the record and, and get answers as quickly as possible. Um, and with that, we are adjourned. You've been listening to Defense Secretary Mark Esper and Joint Chief of Staff's Chairman General Mark Milley testify before the House Armed Services Committee. Lawmakers asked the, the two Pentagon officials about the military's role in the use of force to clear peaceful protesters in Lafayette Square last month. That was done to make a path for President Trump's controversial Bible photo op at St. John's Church. Both men expressed their support for the demonstrations against systemic racism, but defended the deployment of the National Guard against protests they said turned violent. I want to bring in CBSN political contributor Molly Hooper. Hi, Molly. Thanks for sticking with us. So did Esper and Milley defend the military and National Guard's actions against protesters nationwide? And did they give an update on the internal investigations? Yes, they did. And for the most part, they were, were explaining sort of the confusion that was going on that surrounded those events on the 1st of June in Lafayette Square. 
noting that in the lead up to the, the clearing of Lafayette Square, there had been several days of unrest and looting and um, defacing public monuments and just sort of the, the confusion that surrounded everything that was going on with all the protests across the country, but specifically in front of the White House. And, you know, even though during the day on June 1st, the protests were, were largely peaceful, um, again, both, both Millie and Esper said, Said that you know they needed to clear that square because they didn't want what happened um, the night before with the burning of parts of St. John's Church to happen again that night. And and they said really when it came down to it, who who ordered the clearing of Lafayette Square? Neither Mark Esper or Mark Milley could could say with any certainty who directly gave that order, given that there were so many different agencies involved in trying to keep the peace down in that area. And that overall seemed to be um, a consensus that, that, that they agreed on, is that, you know, with the DOJ in charge of almost 22 different agencies, the Bureau of Police, the ICE, Border Patrol, all these different law enforcement agencies, in addition to Department of Interior, who has control over the park police, then you couple that with the DOD and all the police forces that were in D.C., there were a lot of different hands in the pot, so to speak, and, and it was very difficult to, to ascertain exactly who gave that order, which the chairman of the committee found, quote, hard to believe. But again, hmm. in Millie and Esper both tried to describe the, those, those events, they said they couldn't say with any certainty who specifically gave that order. It is sort of hard to believe because you think about, you know, military actions as following a clear chain of command that you would be able to sort of follow backwards. Uh, are they right. saying they're continuing to investigate that? Well, they are. They're, they're looking into that. But again, as Mark Milley specifically explained, there were about seven, seven different um, National Guard, National Guard versions, National Guard groups of troops that came in from di seven different states. That even when those National Guard members came to D.C., they were still under the control of their respective governors. And since D.C. isn't a state, um, technically. The D.C. National Guard is in the chain of command of the DOD and obviously the president. But but that's a little bit of a different situation. However, when you have all those different federal authorities converging together, trying to figure out the command and control, is it's not quite as, as simple as it is if this was a, mil, a strictly military mission where you do know this precise chain of command. In this case, it was more diffuse, which added to the, the confusion of that day. Certainly, it certainly did. All right, so Molly, uh, was the U.S. intel saying Russia backed bounties targeted soldiers in Afghanistan addressed? Yes, it was. And it was Republicans who brought this up. And, and on several occasions, Republicans asked pointed questions about this, one of which was Mike Turner, who is from Ohio. And, and he was essentially the first Republican that, to ask questions. And he, he asked specifically, he asked Mark Esper, were you, did you ever receive a briefing in which the word bounty was mentioned? And Mark Esper said, to the best of his knowledge, he had not received a briefing that included the word bounty. Um, and and he and if he had, then he definitely would have taken more action apparently than than was taken in the time. But both Esper and Mark um, Mark Milley said that force protection is one of the most important things that they that they. Had, they do when, of course, you have the forces deployed. And this intelligence apparently did not come from an agency, an intelligence agency like the DIA, under DOD control. And it had not been verified, according to Esper and Milley, by their own intelligence uh, intelligence community. And so, so there was a little bit of... of um, you know, uh, they weren't necessarily specific on the actions that were taken to increase force protection. But one thing that Mark S uh, that Mark Milley said, General General Milley, said was that the Russians have been trying to um, to stir things up for the Americans in Afghanistan for years. This is not something new. And when that happens, you know, mm -hmm. the military will take every precaution and action they can to protect the forces in the region. And that's something that they have done. But again, this was not. Um, this intel had not been verified by the DIA and other intelligence um, organizations under DOD control. And Molly, what else of note did we learn from Esper and Millie today? 
Well, well, one thing that was interesting was that um, Mark Esper was asked about this, the National Guard helicopter that came down into Lafayette Square the night of June 1st. And he said, listen, on June 2nd, I, I launched an investigation. That investigation has concluded, and members of the Armed Services Committee, at least, will have access to that investigation as early as next week. So, so that's something mm. to look out for. But, but again, interesting. Th this just this this hearing just just sort of showed how difficult and and confusing the effort was um, for the law enforcement people on the ground. But again. Um, you know, you know, as to whether the the National Guard could have done anything better, Mark Milley and Esper are really defending the actions taken by members of the National Guard. And one interesting th thing that um, Mark Milley said was that a lot of the members of the National Guard are police forces are in the are members of the police's police department back home, and so they've been trained in de-escalation. And the units that were called up specifically to to come in and, and help with the civilian defense to keep to keep the civilian disturbance had specifically been trained in de-escalation techniques and were prepared to deal with these type of situations. So, so that was something that I did find of note. Um, learning a little bit more about those individuals who who are part of the. National Guard, who we may see at, you know, protests like this in the future. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Molly Hooper, thank you so much for all your insight. We really appreciate your time. We're going to take a quick break now, but we've got a lot more news ahead. So stay with us. You're streaming CBSN, CBS News, always on. Doctors and scientists in a race against time to cure coronavirus. Every evening we'll show how close they are. Racing to a cure on the CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. The biggest names in politics. Whoa, that's news. Do we have the capacity to deal with what is coming? Face the questions you want answered. Are you looking at a bailout? Can you walk the American people through what happens next? Are you saying you did not ever hear of such a deal? Do you need to level with the American people? Face the nation with Margaret Brennan. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Ah, boom. And reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Time. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative. Da, 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 da. And truly original That's reporting. Great. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday Morning. Tanya Rivero joining you from my home studio. Thank you for being with us. We want to begin with two major rulings from the Supreme Court today regarding President Trump's taxes and financial reports. In a 7-2 decision, the court said Manhattan's chief prosecutor, Cyrus Vance, can obtain the president's business records and tax returns. A second ruling blocked Congress from seeing his financial records, sending it to lower courts. Skylar Henry has details on the Supreme Court's rulings. President Trump's years-long battle to keep his financial records secret culminated in today's Supreme Court ruling. In two separate opinions, with the justices splitting seven to two, the court ruled the president can block the release of his records to Congress, returning the case to the lower courts. But the high court upheld New York prosecutors' demand for the president's tax returns, which Mr. Trump had been fighting. We're fighting all the subpoenas. Look, these aren't like impartial people. Three committees in the Democratic-controlled House and New York prosecutors demanded the president hand over his tax returns, along with other personal financial information. The court heard more than three hours of arguments in May. There is a long, long history of 